Welcome to Mayo Medical Laboratory's Hot Topics. These presentations provide short discussion of current topics and may be helpful to you in your practice. Our speaker for this program is Dr. Glenn Roberts, a professor of laboratory medicine and pathology and microbiology at Mayo Clinic, as well as a consultant in the Division of Clinical Microbiology. Dr. Roberts discusses the features of specific organisms under direct microscopic examination using multiple preparations. This module examines coccidioides, geotrichum, and trichosporin. Thank you, Dr. Roberts. Thank you, Sharon, for that introduction. I have nothing to disclose. This is an ongoing presentation that focuses on the individual groups of organisms as seen uh, using the direct microscopic examination of clinical specimens. The next two slides show you the different methods that can be used for detecting fungi uh, in those clinical specimens as well as in biopsies. It's important to know that not all of these are specific fungal stains so that when you're looking at these stains you have to be thinking about looking for fungi as well. The next slide is just a continuation of those stains. The next slide shows you the direct microscopic examination uh, for the detection of coccidioides emetus or coccidioides posadesi. They cannot be distinguished from each other microscopically. In this case, you would be looking for something that is different from all the other things that you would be looking for. With coccidioides emetus and coccidioides posadesi, you're looking for spherules that may or may not contain endospores. If they contain endospores, these cells do not produce any buds. Might be mistaken for budding yeast cells, but the bud would be absent. Coccidioides is one of those ones that is different from all the others morphologically. Next slide shows you a couple of spherules. These are large structures that reproduce by a progressive cleavage. And if you look at the cell on the left hand side, you can notice that there are lines that surround the periphery of that whole cell. Those are called cleavage furrows. This whole thing reproduces into endospores as a result of progressive cleavage. The cell at the bottom on the right hand side is a bit different. It's hard to tell what stage of development it really is in. Uh, you can just see the spherule wall there and it may not be at a point where it's getting ready to divide yet. The next slide shows you two very large spherules using the, uh, seen in this sample material using the potassium hydroxide prep. The larger one, actually there are three cells in there, two large ones and a smaller one about uh, maybe 1.30, 2 o'clock, uh, the smaller cell is. You don't see anything internally in those cells. So you would look around to try to find if there are cells that contain endospores within them. But generally when you find these cells they are not containing endospores. It's uh, just kind of a given that's going to be difficult to find a typical cell full of endospores. This next slide shows you different stages of development of these spherules and some of those you can see actually contain endospores inside of them. There's a cell at about maybe 11 o'clock up there that uh, looks like two cells sitting adjacent to each other. It looks like for all the world that it's a blastomyces dermatitidis cell. This happens with coccidioides where two adjacent spherules stick together and that means you have to look around at all the fields and get a consensus of what's there and you would find it that most of the cells do not look like those two that are adjacent to each other. They look like the cells you see elsewhere on this slide, round cells that contain or may not contain the endospores that exhibit no budding. Next slide shows you a gigantic spherule containing endospores. And inside there are the endospores that have no buds on them at all, and they're produced inside this cell by progressive cleavage of spherule ruptures. The endospores pour out in the tissue. They in turn enlarge and form spherules again, and they, in, after that, produce endospores, and the cycle just keeps on going like that until it's broken. The next slide shows you two cells, two spherules that are sitting adjacent to each other that look just like slides that you see of blastomyces. You can almost uh, see a broad-based bud between them. In that case, you'd have to continue looking around to you to see if you could find something that, that is either better or it tells you that it's not blastomyces. The next slide shows you what you would, might want to see. The top cell has some endospores in it. The bottom one doesn't really show much, but the wall looks almost like it's double contoured. Not quite as much as blastomyces, though. 
but you um, you have difficulty sometimes in distinguishing two adjacent spherules from blastomyces. This is another one showing the very same thing. The, the top cell actually shows you what a cell that's ruptured and the endospores are pouring out. The bottom cell is also ruptured and you don't see much coming out of it, but you see endospores in the top one and that tells you that it's uh, not uh, blastomyces. This is a very nice spherule that is ruptured and the endospores are pouring out. This is calcul for white. If you saw that, you'd know that you're dealing with coccidioides. In a clinical specimen that's been submitted for culture, oftentimes if you look at it microscopically and it's been sitting out at room temperature, you might find that the spherule in there has germinated. And it does germinate. It will form these germ tubes coming off at random places throughout the spherule. And you can do this even if you have a, uh, let's say you take a clinical specimen and you think you see these, these spherules in there. You can take a drop of that and put it with a drop of water, put it on a slide with a cover slip, put it out at room temperature and let it incubate for a day or two and look at it. And you'll see that those germ tubes will form there. And you see that. There's nothing else really that does that besides coccidioides. The next one shows you what happens as well. If, the, if it sits for a little longer, the hyphae begin to form of where those germ tubes are and they, for, they branch it di uh, dichotomously at 45 degree angle and uh, that's what you see sometimes in a cavitary leaf from the coccidioides. So these things have the capability of producing septate branching hyphae and this is what it would look like in a clinical specimen that it were germinated and so this would be helpful to make a diagnosis particularly in a sample that's been submitted has been in the mail for a few days. This slide shows you spherules and endospores in all different stages of development. On the right hand side you see the spherules that are just very large and contain numerous endospores. Towards the left side you see some of them that are hollow. You see some that are very small. Those are the spherules that may or contain no endospores or just a few or may just be starting to develop them. So you see all sorts of stages of development in there. And actually, if you look closely, you can see with some of those ones on the left-hand side, you can see basically what look like cleavage furrows in there. So it's dividing up the, the spherule into endospores. Same thing on the next slide, showing you different stages of development of coccidioides. Some of those are very tiny, all the way to the ones that are up as large as maybe 60 microns. And the next slide shows you a larger view of some of the, the spherules, and you can notice that on the one about 8 o'clock, the periphery of that cell shows you what looks like uh, dividing uh, endospores that are being produced by progressive cleavage. The next one shows you a f one field over from the last slide that you saw. This happens to be the edge of a cavitary lesion that has a communication with an airway. And you saw a minute ago that slide uh, that showed dichotomously branching hyphae out of the side of an endospore or a spherule. This is showing you exactly what happens within a cavitary lesion where there's a connection with an airway. The organism can produce spherules and endospores, but it also can produce acute angle branching just like aspergillus, just like any of the other moles. And if you didn't look around and be, you weren't able to find anything else, you would not know what mold it would be. But in this case, if you looked around, you would find those spherules and endospores sitting adjacent to this area and you would know you'd be dealing with coccidioides. This is an unusual finding, but it's not uncommon. This slide is an overstained silver slide. The left-hand upper uh, part of the slide shows you, maybe about uh, 11 o'clock, shows you a big spherule with endospores on the inside. The others appear to be hollow, but they're so darkly stained it's hard to tell. The next slide is the silver stain slide showing you a better representation of what the different stages uh, of spherule development and endospore production would look like. Some of those on the right hand side are big spherules that are ruptured and released endospores you see coming out in the tissue. And on the left hand side there are some of the spherules that are hollow and then there are some that actually contain endospores. So this is what coccidioides looks like in different stages of development. If you saw that you'd have no doubt that's what it is. This is the next slide shows you uh, an HD stain slide with a big spherule in the center and it's ruptured and the endospores will be coming out. But notice it's surrounded by neutrophils. And a lot of times when the, the spherule ruptures, the endospores start to come out. You'll see an influx of neutrophils around the perimeter of the spherule. 
And this is a silver stained slide showing you on the left hand side uh, about maybe 8 o'clock. Big spherule. That's hard to tell what's in the inside. If you look over on the other side of the slide, you'll see there's a smaller one in the background. They're not always textbook perfect, and it does keep re-emphasizing that you need to continually look at everything you can find to make a diagnosis because a lot of times one field is just simply not going to tell you enough. The next part of this uh, presentation would be the discussion of, of hyaline septate hypi uh, produ that produce arthrokinidia. And, and when you see a slide, let's say you happen to have a clinical specimen and basically all you see are septate hypi and you see arthrokinidia, then what do you think about? Well, you think about at least two organisms, and two in particular, geotricum and trichospora. The geotricum, basically all you're going to see are arthrokinidia. These are the rectangular cells that hypi produce, the breakdown of hypi into rectangular fragments. And trichosporon shows you the same thing, except in addition to the arthrokinidia, you may find budding cells present. They're not going to be there in great numbers, and it'll be hard to find. This actually, the next slide came from a biopsy from a patient that we saw with leukemia. And we found in this biopsy, these rectangular arthrokinidia, the ends of some of them might have been a little bit rounded, but we saw a lot of septate hyphae, and that's all that we saw. And basically, all you can say is that it's going to be trichosporon or geotricum because you may or may not be able to detect the budding cells in there. And, and uh, geotricum is the one that has uh, no buds, and trichosporon has some budding cells. Uh, trichosporon is the one that causes disease the most often, particularly in leukemic patients. This is a phase contrast photomicrograph of hyphae that are broken down to arthrokinidia. You can see there are rectangular segments sitting around uh, all over everywhere, and uh, that's what a geotricum would look like. Trichosporon would look the same unless you were to find a, an area where you found a few budding cells. Then you could call it trichosporon. This uh, slide here shows you some rectangular arthrokinidia. And if you look around in there, you could almost imagine that you see some budding cells here and there. And if you did, that would be trichosporon. If you didn't, that would be geotricum. And so you just have to continue to look to see what the consensus is. And that's what you have to do with most everything is look to see what's there and get a consensus of what the morphology is going to be. This happens to be from the same biopsy, the next slide, uh, or the, the first one I showed you there. And in there, there are pieces of hypi that are broken down into rectangular arthrokinidia. And in this case, it's very difficult to tell if there are any budding cells in there or not. And this turns out to be trichosporon. And so it's supposed to have a few budding cells, but maybe not any or maybe just a very few. And so you would not be able to primarily detect it from geotricum based on the microscopic morphology here. This is a discussion of uh, the cells that you see with coccidioides and also with uh, geotricum and trichosporon.